sun in the middle of winter. Um, so we welcome you here with the sun today and uh, we're just so thankful that you're joining us here either in person or online. We're glad to have you connecting with us. So would you stand and would you join with us um, as we collectively join in worship through music this morning. Psalm 119 verses 1 to 8 says this, Blessed are they whose ways are blameless who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who keep his statutes and seek him with all of their heart. They do nothing wrong. They walk in his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all of your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I lean in your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. That, that was not the right words. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, let's go. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. 
Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is a feeling love. Take my place, that you would bear my cross. You lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Slain. Worthy is the King who conquers the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who slain. You would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. You can have a seat. Hospitality. What does this mean? A concierge? A good meal? A place to rest? In the original Greek, this is translated as the love of a stranger. So how do we make a stranger feel loved and a part of our church? Every day, there is a family in your surrounding community that is facing a crisis. A single mom who loses her part-time job. A dad in the hospital because of illness, and mom is the only one with income. A mom in a shelter, and her children are vulnerable. A home is flooded, and there is nowhere to live. These families end up having no one to turn to. They have no other options. For centuries, the church was the central institution those in need turned to. Yet in recent years, the church has stepped back, while other social agencies have stepped in. It's time the church began to live out hospitality the biblical way. Safe Families for Children provides the process and structure your church needs to serve families in times of crisis. How do we do it? Well, when you start Safe Families in your church, you start by educating and building an awareness that there is a need. Then you will begin to notice people that are passionate about helping others in times of need. And they become what we call ministry leads, family coaches, family friends, resource friends, and host families. Host, hold on a minute, like in my house? Well, yes, host families are highly trained, background-checked, compassionate families. These families are then placed with a child from a family facing a crisis, helping that family and giving them time to get back on their feet. But wait, there's more. As your ministry grows, we help identify volunteers who can aid and support these families. A church ministry lead acts as the connection point between safe families and the church. We also identify family coaches, people that coordinate connecting a family in need with a host family and nurturing that relationship throughout the process. Internally, the DNA of your church will change. Families that were hesitant at first will see others doing it and join in. 
Externally, it will put your church in a new light in the community as it shows your willingness to show biblical hospitality to others. Join us in helping families in crisis by showing them the hospitality they need in a time of crisis. Safe families. Hey, good morning. It's good to be with you. Thanks so much for taking some time to be with us. So that Safe Families video you might recall uh, from a couple of weeks ago when Laura Metcalf was here. There is a desire to bring a chapter of Safe Families uh, Canada to the Sarnia-Lambton area. Now as you listen to this video when it speaks a, of a church-specific location for Safe Families Canada, I want you to keep in mind that we're not talking about our church specifically. What we, what our, what our leadership really likes about this is it is a desire of Safe Families Canada to unite churches across our region to be able to bring a chapter of this. So it's not Sarnia EMC hosting Safe Family Canada. It is uh, a network of churches in our community to do to be able to work together to do that. And that gives strength not only to this ministry, but to us uh, as a, as a uh, network of churches, as a body of churches here in our region, but also then to our community. And, uh, and so there is an information session next Sunday evening at, uh, what time does that say up there? Six o'clock. Uh, so at six o'clock. And so could you let us know if you're interested? Let me encourage you to, to uh, share that information. And if others are interested to come and learn about what Safe Canada, Families Canada is and uh, what it can do and how potentially you can be involved or at least praying for this uh, to happen, then, um, then uh, please, uh, please do so. And so you'll find that, inform that, uh, that graphic in our, in our e-bulletin uh, as well, and uh, feel free to share that information around. I also want to remind you that as we go through the month of February, our, our uh, benevolence focus, our mission focus is uh, through Compassion Canada with the Child Survivor uh, Program uh, in El Salvador. And so anything that is given or designated towards our benevolence uh, can, will be um, um, directed towards uh, this project. If you want to give specifically to that, uh, there is a direct link to Compassion uh, through that QR code. Um, does, everybody, does everybody know how to use a QR code? How many people don't know what a QR code is and would like a little lesson? All right, let's do that. All right, so you have a cell phone. I don't have mine on me, but you have a cell phone. You can take your cell phone out and you can hold it up so that the camera camera looks at holds that image. Go ahead, try it. Okay? And when you do, you'll see a little link pop up and you press on that link. Kelly's doing it. All right, Kelly, you just tell us if this is working. There's Rebecca. Rebecca, you've used a QR code before. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay, so that's when you see those things, you, you scan them. Or you can often do that at restaurants now. You scan a QR code, it brings the menu up right on your phone. Did you, right? It, if you have internet, yes. If you have a data plan that allows you, that's right. However, we do have a lot of other options for you. So you can give directly to the church and we'll make sure. But there you go. That's how you use a QR code. There you, you learned something today. We are full service here, actually. Uh, and so thanks for learning along with us. So uh, that's what's happening through the month of February. And the last week of February is our annual meeting on uh, February 26th. And we are looking forward to having our annual meeting be in person. And uh, there are some things that we need to vote on. And, uh, and so whether that's the budget, there's a couple new policies. And, uh, and then those who will be serving on our, um, on our uh, governing board uh, for, the next, uh, for the next two years, who are uh, Pat Halls and uh, Josh Keita, Stan Keita, and Jim Nelson. Uh, they are uh, being, um, at, we're looking to affirm them uh, in, uh, to serve on the uh, governing board for these uh, next couple of years. And so uh, we're, 
those are the things that you need to keep in mind. Thank you for those of you who've already read your annual, annual report. There are still a few copies, paper copies available on the counters. And uh, I think all our active members receive one digitally. If you are not a member and you would like to receive one digitally, then just contact the church office and we can, uh, we'll certainly send you that as well. And just so that you know that everybody's welcome to stay for the annual meeting portion, which Lord willing will be brief um, because we've had the information out uh, ahead of time and, and we're happy to address any, any questions in advance of that. Uh, and then following that, we're going to make our way upstairs for a soup luncheon. And we're thankful for the many people, for the number of people who have agreed to serve and those who have agreed to make soup. So now we just need to find out if anybody's going to come. <laughs> did, did you say you're going to come? Have you, have you committed to that yet? All right. So... <laughs> It's, it's just an order of events, right? So uh, we are going to, so uh, you do need to let us know if you're going to be coming to that luncheon. And there are sign-up lists on the counters for you to manually write your name, or you can send an email into the office to say, hey, I'm going to come, and this is how many are going to come with me. All right, does that sound good? Does that sound fair? We'd love to be able to spend a little extra time together. It's soup and salad, really simple. Uh, and uh, would love to be able to spend that time with you uh, there. Now, before, uh, as we go, go into this time, uh, I just want to, there's a lot of other really good things that are happening, um, and, uh, wanna, and I want to just encourage you to see our website or, or the e-bulletin uh, for that, uh, for those things that are, are coming up as well in the next few weeks. Um, but I just wanted to uh, let you know, um, as many of you do know, um, Maggie uh, Margaret Ettinger um, passed away last weekend, and um, she's the daughter of uh, Mimi. So Mimi was in hospital, uh, having still recovering from her hip. She was in hospital on uh, in Petrolia last weekend, but then got moved to Sarnia, uh, and uh, and then uh, Maggie passed away. Uh, unexpectedly on the weekend, and so um, Bailey is uh, Maggie's daughter, um, who many of you know, uh, and uh, Maya and Grayson is our uh, two, uh, the other two uh, kids of Maggie, and Bailey is going to be looking after Maya and uh, Grayson, and so as you can imagine, it's a very difficult time. Maybe you can't even imagine, and that's probably more likely the scenario we can't even imagine. Uh, and so there's a lot of layers to that. Thank you already for your generous response to, to this family uh, during these days. Uh, your expressions of comfort, your tangible expression of help, uh, as you've been asked, uh, has, been, um, has been very warmly received. And so would you continue to pray for them uh, during these days? There is a visitation this Wednesday from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at Smith's Funeral Home. A uh, funeral service, a celebration of life service will take place at a date to be determined. Uh, and uh, so there's a couple of factors around that um, that we are just waiting for some clarity on. But uh, would you continue to pray for them um, as, uh, as there's a lot of decisions that need to be made here over the next uh, little while. But we're already thankful for how the Lord is uh, providing and uh, expressing his care to them through many people in our community. Uh, and so thanks uh, for that. And, uh, and in, our, in our world, right, there's this huge devastation, this earthquake that has taken tens of thousands of lives in Turkey and Syria, uh, in addition to the war in uh, Ukraine that seems to persist and never end. And maybe you hear, you hear these things globally, and you think, well, that doesn't really affect me. But then you hear something like this that has happened to this family that we know and we care about. Uh, and uh, that challenges you, and maybe then your own circumstances might be difficult uh, as well. And we come together, uh, when we come together, it's, yes, it's good to celebrate. It's important to celebrate God's favor and care for us. But we do so in the midst of the hurt that we sometimes all feel. And so I want to read for you uh, some words from uh, Psalm 85 and just invite you to pray with me. And as we pray, maybe there's something that God is, uh, that you're working through, that you need to just 
uh, voice to God in the quietness of this time as you listen uh, to these words. <clears throat> Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. We will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants. Let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace, they kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. So, Father, as we... Uh, as we come before you this morning, we give you thanks for the beautiful day that you have given to us. We give you thanks for the freedom that you extend to us in this place to gather, to learn, to encourage one another, to bring comfort to one another. We thank you all the more that you are with us, that you hear us. Would you hear our prayer? For this family here locally, uh, part of our community, these kids, their world is in turmoil. They need to know that you are stepping before them in a path of righteousness where peace and love and faithfulness can be found. Father, we, we pray for our world and the turmoil that exists, the unfathomable destruction in countries so far removed from our awareness. And we ask, God, that you would bring resource and help and strength and perseverance. And we pray, Father, that if there are those who can still be rescued, that that indeed would be the case, that you would rescue from danger. And we ask that you would hear the cry and the prayer of our heart for those things that are confusing or difficult or hard, troubling. God, lead us. God, help us. As you hear our prayer, may we also be reminded that you are with us. Would you help us to receive that which comes, the help that comes from others. And would you also, Father, help beyond a way that we seem, that, that we can figure out is possible. Show yourself strong in this. So we pray on behalf of others. We pray on behalf of our world and we submit ourselves for those things that we need. Because, Jesus, of all that you have done for us and all that you continue to do, and we pray in your name, amen. Amen. Right. Thanks for sharing uh, in that with us. Uh, we're going to have our kids head off to Kid Jam. Mikel is there at the back, so if you want to join her, if you are here and you're age 2 to grade 6, you can make your way out. And uh, then the parents of the 2, 3, 4, and 5-year-olds, you'll have to sign your kids in and then sign them back out at the end. For the rest of us, we're going to stand and sing together and... Um, as we're all doing that, I, I just wanted to read this verse for you. Ver this verse, the second verse of this piece we're going to sing says, The night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the, sa the Savior he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. So as we sing this together, would this be our prayer today? What 
gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. strange and divine I can sing all is mine yet not I but through Christ in me the night is dark but I am not forsaken for by my side the Savior he will stay Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home, and day by day I know he will renew me, until I stand with joy before the
Father, thank you for this opportunity that we can come into your house, God, that we can sing praises to you, God. We just pray that you would move freely through this place this morning, God, that we would encounter you in a really special way. We just pray that you would bless us as a community of believers in this place. We pray this in your name, and all God's people said, amen. You can have a seat. Sunday, baby. What can be more exciting than that? Well, let me tell you what can be more exciting than that. It's what your pastor tells you every week. What's more exciting than Super Bowl Sunday is the kingdom of God and you're on Team Jesus, the winning team. All right, all right. Don't you miss that guy? So for those of you who are new or relatively, uh, we haven't been, I don't think we've been in person in, in, on Super Bowl Sunday in a long time. So we said, there's a whole series of these videos uh, that we have shown over the years. Because, you know, we come together in great nobility here on Sunday morning of, uh, as we, as many of us are in the regular habit of doing. And most of us, may, not, maybe not most of us, a lot of us understand that there is a, Hello. <laughs> Nobody even hardly saw you do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Nathan has memorized all his music. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, um, you want me to do this too? I'll, I'll move that one. Is that better? Okay. Uh, so... Um, so how many people know that there is a relatively large, significant football game on later today? How many people, this is new news? Yeah, all right. You six people? Uh, that's great. And um, yeah, so, you know, we try not to make uh, too big of an emphasis on that. How many people know which teams are playing? AJ, what teams are playing? Philadelphia Eagles and and the Kansas City Chiefs. That lady right over there. Okay, Betty Ann, who are you going for? All right. All right. Who else is going for the Chiefs here today? How many people? Who, who's going for the Eagles here today? Uh, looks like it's a Chief crowd for those who are willing to declare. Right. Others are, I choose not to declare who I cheer for in, uh, in a given, on a given Sunday, um, but I'll leave that up to your imagination. Um, there you go. So just with that out of the way, is everybody cleansed from that? This is what we're thinking about, and uh, now let's just uh, let's take some time and focus in on, on what uh, God has for us. So I'm going to invite you to get your Bibles open, spend a little time uh, in God's Word, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, your Bible app or your Bible 
um, and uh, we'll we'll go through it here in uh, in a little bit. But would you just uh, try, uh, would you just join me in uh, asking God to teach us, Father? Thank you uh, for as we have talked about the freedom that you give us to open your word to learn from you, and uh, and so we pray that indeed your spirit would teach us. Take your word, apply it to our lives, uh, move it even around those places that we might close off a little bit, and uh, that we might see, because of your generosity towards us, there's so much that we have yet to discover. And so teach us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. God is generous towards us. We were created from the generosity of God who came close and who helped us to learn to enjoy the world that he created. However, our selfish inclination, which God calls sin, tempts our capacity to honor the God-given limitation of his generosity. The limitation is meant to help us, not to hurt us. And the good news is that God has provided a way for us to demonstrate a generous response, which he uses. He uses to transform our natural selfishness to bring further blessing to the lives of others. And as we do, it strengthens our identity as his children. Last week, we learned about God's generous nature. Today, we want to learn about our generous response. There's an, incredible, there's an incredible amount of scripture available to address this topic. This passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is just one of many that provide a consistent theme, I feel. Let's listen to these first six verses. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first, first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. <clears throat> Certainly, admittedly, when it comes to speaking on the topic of giving, there can often be a reluctance on behalf of churches and uh, pastors. Sometimes this teaching comes uh, as a prelude to a building campaign or because maybe of a, a shortfall in budgeted income. This is neither. This is not a pin your hand, arm behind your back kind of message. And certainly in these days through the pandemic and now post-pandemic, most of you will recognize that we don't actually formally have an offering time as part of our gathering. We don't ask people to commit to giving a specific amount for a period of time, nor do we analyze the giving that takes place. In fact, we barely even mention it in our times together. The reasons why, I pray, will become clearer as we proceed this morning. In all things, we are growing in our understanding of what we're about to learn together. And it's anchored in two main ideas that are mentioned here in these first few verses. One, that God gives generously. You see that at the start of, of verse 1. They were giving because of the grace that God had given to them. But God is, God is their provider, much like God was a provider for Abraham. He understood that Giving was part of God's nature, Jehovah Jireh, God our provider. Abraham received his son Isaac as the son that God provided, and he blessed Isaac, and he loved Isaac, and he worshipped with God. He worshipped God with Isaac. But when God said, I need all of Isaac, 
Abraham, through much learning, and which included failure along the way, Abraham was finally ready to give completely. In the unimaginable readiness of, to, to give, Abraham recognized that God had already prepared to give more beyond Isaac beyond the ram who would be substituted for Isaac. God was prepared to bring a blessing to many nations and many people as Abraham responded. God pre is prepared to bring blessing to our lives and through our lives for the advancement of his kingdom purposes. And that is a theme that runs right through the biblical story. And as the Old Testament comes to a close, we are reminded that God is positioned and ready to provide. He wants to bring blessing as we honor him in our tithes and in our offerings. He invites us to test his generous readiness to bless. So God is generous. And secondly, notice that God gives unexpectedly. Often our, our default position is, I don't think I have anything to give, or that, you know, this is what I have to give. It's probably not that significant, so why should I even bother? You know, when we start with what we think we can't do, we actually deny ourselves the opportunity to see how the Lord can take what he has entrusted to us and multiply it in connection with others to make a kingdom difference. The people of the Macedonian churches wanted to participate in the blessing of giving. It's almost as though Paul and some of the leaders were kind of, uh, they're, they're in a really tough spot. They, we shouldn't put this on them. And they were like, no, we insist. And if you read through Acts chapter 16 and 17, you'll, you'll read about churches like the Philippians and, and the Thessalonians and the brutal circumstances that they were under, the op opposition that they faced, and the persecutions that came as a result of declaring a faith in Jesus. And yet, and yet, here they are with a desire to give. You know, one of my favorite stories from our most recent trip to El Salvador is uh, one of this man in this picture uh, named Manuel. He worked with uh, our, our build team uh, all of the week in the heat, and he actually did the hard stuff. He did the digging of holes, and he did it with great energy and joyful enthusiasm. When others grew tired, including us, he kept going. And I thought to myself and expressed to some of our team, this guy must be receiving a house at some point this week. That's why he's, that's why he's so energetic about what he's doing. However, as the, as the days passed, it became clear that he wasn't receiving a home. And so we asked him, like, what's your deal? Why, why, why give so generously? And he said he received a house three years ago. He said it cost him a lot, which, by the way, is, is 100 U.S. dollars, which doesn't translate to a lot to you, but to a farm laborer, that's almost three months of wages. However, he said the difference with how the Lord has blessed his family with good health, with stable employment, with safety, those things cannot be measured. And how can he not then participate in allowing somebody else to experience that? He said he has received so much that every time he hears about houses being built in his community, he wants to come and to give all the energy that he has because that's what he can offer to God and to his community. Out of extreme poverty, Manuel is a steward of the overflowing rich generosity of God. Now with absolute confidence and knowing that God gives generously and unexpectedly, we therefore need to continually cultivate a generous response. And to that end, firstly, we must give ourselves to God, just like the Macedonians and Manuel. 
in response to God, we give ourselves, right? When, when God called Abram, he said, here I am. When God called Isaiah, he said, here am I. We present our, ourselves first to God as living sacrifices, loving him with all that we are, with all of our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength. The Macedonians did not allow their circumstances to change the way they had come to understand the way God views them. He was generous to them. And despite their situation, they gave themselves first to the Lord. Our ability to serve and to give is often a reflection on how we view the generosity of God towards us. So secondly, then we give ourselves to others, to the service of others, as you read about here. Giving isn't a punishment. It isn't a religious ritual. To serve others, to give in response, is, is a response that comes out of a desire to see God's generous love made known through us, through our lives towards others. We want to be part of conveying that love, and so we serve. We make adjustments to our schedule to help others as a means of displaying the generosity of God. Thirdly, we give in response to God's grace. Serving is an enablement of God's grace. It's one of the ways in which we, we see the evidence of the presence of God among us, is how we serve one another. You'll notice as you continue to read through the passage, and in fact, you, I encourage you to read through the rest of chapter 8 and chapter 9 and chapter 10, about the significance of this kind of response. When we forget about the fact that God has been gracious to us, then giving to Him and His kingdom purposes will seem intrusive and offensive to us. It'll seem like it's getting in the way of our plans. Therefore, because of God's grace to us, we can give, we should give, to further His work of grace in our community and in the world. But re realize this. Again, we don't give out of empty, mechanical, religious ritual. We give in confident faith because of the example of Jesus given to us. It's significant and worthwhile to highlight in, in your text these verses, verses 7 to 9 of chapter 8. It reminds you every time, you, maybe you think, oh, you, you have this hesitation creep up. It's, this is a great reminder God is asking you to give, and, it's, and, and in so doing, he's inviting you to receive a blessing and empowerment that we witness in Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's asking you to give in response to the example of Jesus towards us upon whom our faith is established. Let's read in verse, starting in verse 7. But since you excel in everything... In faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And as we keep those things in mind, then we are able, we're actually free to give as stewards or as managers of the resources God has entrusted to us. Let's continue, actually, uh, if you have that still open in verse 10. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have a desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. 
For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality, as it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. <clears throat> so how do we give? That's a good question. The question I'm not going to answer is, how much do you give? But I do believe that God gives us some, some instruction on how to give, which will inform how much to give. And I've tried to make this as simple as possible to remember. A, B, C, D. Right? A, B, C, D. Acknowledge, bless, commit, depend. The first is, as we've already talked about, to acknowledge. Acknowledge that I, er, everything that I receive that comes to me belongs to the Lord. I do not own anything, but it's all the Lord's, and it's to be used for the purpose of his kingdom and for his glory. Center yourselves on that. Acknowledge that God is the one who owns it all. We are managers. We are stewards of that which has been entrusted to us by God. Secondly, B, acknowledges A, B, bless. Take time, a good way, sometimes we can, we can get off track with that. Take time to give thanks to God, to tangibly express that, with words for what he has entrusted to you. It helps to prevent that attachment where you think, this is mine, I have to keep this. Give thanks to God for what he entrusts to you and ask him to use it as a blessing to others. That blessing piece goes both ways. We bless God, we praise him for that which has been given. It breaks that idea of complaining or entitlement. And then we ask God to help us to use what we have to bless others. Acknowledge, bless, A, B, C, commit. Now this is, a, this is really, this is, if you give those first two I say quickly, but they're actually really hard. This, I'll take a little longer to speak about it's probably just as hard, or maybe harder. Commit. Make a decision and stay with it. Give with a gladness of heart. Give in recognition of God's ownership, as we've just talked about. Understand this, and some of you will come in here, you'll, see, you'll, you'll start to hear this, and maybe you have a little bit of a wall that's coming up within you. Some of you, whether you're here or where you're watching uh, later online. You think, well, what about this tithe? Is the tithe still relevant? <clears throat> you know, in, in the end of, uh, at the end of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, and certainly all through the Testament, the tithe is mentioned. And for those, the tithe literally means 10%. 10% of that which... Uh, is, uh, is entrusted to us. We give that to the Lord as, as a first act in recognition that the whole belongs to the Lord. Often we kind of go through in our, our budgets, especially now in an electronic world, and we kind of maybe try to figure out what can we fit in after everything else has been accounted for. But God says, if everything belongs to me, I just desire to you to recognize that by, by giving this 10%. And you might say, well, that's, you know, what, what about this idea of cheerful giving? And there's a tithe still, that seems really religious. And I, I, I'll simply say this. Those who understand this and build it into their lives, it's not easy they end up saying, well, how can I give more? Those who find reasons to not, to fight against that, and just, just so we're, you know, we're not picking on anybody uh, here. In North America, the average uh, Bible-believing, church-attending 
congregant gives about 2 to 3% of their income. So just so, just so we know that, this is, this is for everybody. So uh, as we, uh, those who do not understand this continue to struggle in the area of finances. To tithe is literally 10%. That's the starting place. And you say, well, isn't that tied to the law? And the law no longer exists. Well, if you read through the Bible, you come to Genesis chapter 4. It's only four chapters in. You read that Abel gave this offering to the Lord, the best of what he had. It doesn't tie a specific percentage to that, but he brought the best of what he had. And then we read about Abraham before the religious laws came into place who gave a tithe, a tithe to Melchizedek, who was a foreshadowing of Jesus. And so the idea of the tithe is predates the law. And in fact, when Jesus comes along in Matthew chapter 18, he affirms that, but not in its re religiosity, not in its ritual, but in addition to the action of justice and mercy and compassion towards others. And so we need to acknowledge the importance of of just as Jesus has, and just as God has, the importance of this first portion, our best, our first, goes to the Lord. And therefore we give in recognition, therefore we give in recognition of our stewardship of God's character, our stewardship, our desire to partner with what God is doing in the world so that he will demonstrate his grace through us. How do we do that? The, the list is long, and some of you are, are way better at this uh, than, I, than I and we are, and we're all in a process of growing. But here's some things that we've learned. Live simply, below your means, and that might take constant adjustment in these times. Avoid and eliminate bad debt and credit. Work hard at that. Do that first. Avoid and eliminate bad debt and credit. Do what you know God desires for you to do. Allow him to complete his work of grace in you. Don't wait until you can. Continue to make a movement towards this idea of giving to God and his kingdom. Be prepared to share resources with others. Now that is easy sometimes to say, but what that also requires is you also have to be prepared to say, this is a need that I have so that others can help you. Or you continually pray about that need and ask God to bring people who will be able to resource that. We need to share in life's journeys with one another. One of the gifts that we have at our home is uh, we've been neighbors with the same people for over 20 years. And over time, we quickly realized we don't need to each have the same kind of stuff. We can share those things, and together we help each other in that. And there's all kinds of ways to do that, but it takes a humility to say, hey, I'm, I'm okay with using your stuff for a little while. But too many of us have this idea of, it's okay, I, I'd rather struggle alone. And so when we read these words in verses 13 to 15, we can be tempted to read them through a lens that causes more confusion and division because of the way it's often translated in English. And those words that I'm referring to is the idea that everybody should be equal or there should be equality. And I don't like the way it's written in the NIV. I'll just t I'll tell you that. In some of the other versions, there are some better translations about it because the intention is not equality in terms of as you listen, maybe as I listen, maybe you're smarter than me. As I listen, I think, oh, well, that, does, that mean, does that mean we should all have the same income? Is that a socialist uh, perspective on that? Let me assure you that it's not in, in, in its original intention. What the original intention is, there should be equality in the exchange of generosity towards one another. We should all be ready to give. Some of us are way better at looking for others to give to us, to take to receive, to have others do for us, then we are ready to do for others. There should be an equality of readiness to respond to the grace of God by giving one to another. <clears throat> These kinds of solutions to the, to the needs of our society, we have, we have uh, almost 
as a church given those over to social agencies and government whereas god says no actually the church the church should be involved in that <clears throat> i am free to give and as, a, as an expression for my love for god and my faith and trust in his kingdom rule in so doing I am also trusting him to, to, to supply my need through others in due course. So be prepared then to help. In addition to tithing regularly, be generous. Be prepared to give. Set aside an amount. So we, we give first to God, and then we set aside an amount on a regular basis. So maybe it's a smaller amount for some. Maybe it's bigger for others. And so that you're ready to respond when you hear of needs around us. The purpose of giving generously is an act of worship that acknowledges that God desires to help those in need, the poor, the strangers among us, the fatherless, the widow. You know, it's not that God needs our money. Rather, giving serves as an external material testimony, a witness, a story, a declaration that God owns everything, all that is material, all that is spiritual in and around us. Tithing and generosity are, indi are indicators of God's ownership. He's looking for the right attitude in our response. Whoever is generous to the poor, Proverbs says, lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for that deed. In the Old Testament book of Malachi, at the, as, this, as, a, as, a, as the uh, Old Testament closes, God wants us, says, he wants to direct that whole tithe into the storehouse. It's an agricultural term where the offerings were given out of the produce of the land. But the storehouse had four, the, the, the means by w the things that happened as a result of that were that the tribe of Levi and the priests were taken care of, the prophets. So these first two groups would be like ministers of today. They were cared for. The, the widows, the Hebrew widows and orphans living within their city, they would be cared for. The, and the widow and orphans and the foreigners in their land and around their city would be cared for. And as we cross into the New Testament, the movement of the kingdom establishes the church. The principle of giving is not negated. In fact, it is emphasized. As churches were being established in cities, giving became more monetary than agricultural. And an example given to us in the book of Acts is that the church should be positioned to provide generously for those who minister the word and providing help to those in need, particularly in a society that was increasingly hostile towards the gospel of Jesus Christ and those who profess faith in Christ. And they were oppressive to those on the margins who didn't look like they do or acted like they do. The examples are plentiful of people selling or people living simply, selling their excess, bringing their funds as offerings to help true widows, to help those in need, to help the fatherless, to, re to relate to those of other ethnicities and cultures, all as a means of giving expression to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Over the years at the SEMC, we have been growing in our understanding of this purpose. For those who have taken time to read through our annual report first, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you for doing that. One of the many things that you'll observe is that we consider everything that we do to be about mission. It's a mission budget. We don't have a specific mission line or evangelism line. Everything we do, we do in the name of Jesus. And over the years, we have perfectly sought to deepen our understanding of what it looks like. And God is using this posture to grow our community to grow, our, under, to grow our, our concept of how we serve our community, not only with our facility, but as people. We want to serve and resource community groups. We want to, we want to help those who are underserviced and under-resourced, like Friendship Group, 
who serves the mentally fragile or like the camp for autistic children or for providing self, a, a safe and welcoming place for seniors. And right now there are over 100 students who are playing basketball in our gym. And many of these children and families can't afford or wouldn't be able to participate in other sports camps in our, Lee, in our city. Or our partnership with Lampton Circles who mentor people out of generational poverty or our growing understanding of God's mission allows us to support organizations that address the needs of our community. Like the Pregnancy Option and Support Center or like, or like the Sexual Assault Center. Or like areas of injustice and oppression where victims of domestic abuse and human trafficking are found. The way in which we have been highlighting these specific needs on a monthly basis, both locally and globally, is an intentional reflection of this. And in so doing, we are not seeing God provide less, but provide more. And we say thank you to you for responding to the grace of God first. It makes no logical sense how the Lord has been supplying these efforts over these last few years in particular. We continue to desire to grow in our calling to be his storehouse, to, be, to demonstrate integrity that reflects the intention of God, to meet the needs of people in our community in the name of Jesus, in both in word and in deed. We want to manage and steward to be a channel through which the evidence of his kingdom is demonstrated to all those who come in contact with us. As we have emerged from the pandemic, we have also recognized God's provision in unexpected and gracious ways. Not coincidentally, we have recognized that this has come in relationship to the emphasis that we, the emphases that we have just, that I've just mentioned. More significantly and with humility, it is also a reflection that by God's grace, everything that we have undertaken as the SEMC is inviting of and inclusive of our greater community in the name of Jesus. By God's grace, he is supplying our need for his kingdom purpose. And even as I stand here, we are recognizing that God has more that he is positioning us to address in this community as we lift high the name of Jesus and we move out by his grace. Acknowledge, bless, commit, depend. <clears throat> Dependence upon God is hard. In chapter 9, if you read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verses 6 to 8, it says this. Remember, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will, be a, you will abound in every good work. God says you choose. You choose how you want to be blessed in a sense, right? God does love a cheerful giver. We share, we give, knowing that God is our provider. We give knowing that in a fallen world, it is not transactional that where we say, if I give this much, then this is how much I should receive. That is not the primary motivation of our heart. We give first in seeking his kingdom, knowing that he can look after our needs and filter away our wants and our desires, our unnecessary comforts. Most people who use, God doesn't want, expect us to tithe, but give cheerfully as a reason or excuse. Do so to protect their own self-interests. Many Christians are under the impression that God directs financially only by an abundance of money. This is not necessarily true. Sometimes he directs by withholding financial abundance. And as such, in those times, he is pruning us he expects us to live on what he provides and not be pressured by the desire for more. He is refining 
our character in that. God wants us to learn to be content in all circumstances. And he is willing to supply us with the never-ending strength of Christ as we serve his kingdom. And maybe you're listening and it's a lot. And you think, well, is this true? I, are you sure? You're welcome. You're welcome to check it out. I'm not going to follow up with you on it. We're going to keep trusting God for it. But let me just ask you this. Does Jesus have anything to say about this? Because this is important, right? A, B, C, D. Acknowledge, bless, commit, depend. Does Jesus have any kind of reflection on this? Because that's a really good question with anything that you learn. In Matthew chapter 14, Jesus is there with the disciples, and there's 5,000 5, people, probably 15,000 people around them, and they're hungry. It's the end of the day, and the disciples have a need. They have a need. But Jesus says, wait, well, feed them first. But they have a need. They feed them first. What do you have? We only have this. And so we see this pattern here with Jesus where he acknowledges what is given, just a few loaves and uh, some fish, right? He acknowledges that that is, that is given. And it says, <clears throat> bring them to me, he says. And he directs the people to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and two fish, he looks up to heaven. So he acknowledges it. And he looks up to heaven, and he, broke, and he breaks the loaves. So he blesses it. And then he commits to giving. And he gives it to the disciples, and, they, and the disciples give them to the people. And then you know what we read? These words. Then they were all satisfied. They were all satisfied. They were contented in that. Acknowledge, bless, commit, depend. It's not a formula, but it's a way of ordering our heart. May God use that in your life. Thank you for those of you who have faithfully understood this, and in small portion or large, God is using you to help us as a family, as a unit, to make a difference in our community in the name of Jesus. Let's, may that continue to be so. Let's pray together. Father, we, um, <clears throat> we acknowledge that you are the giver of all good things. And we are so thankful for that which you have entrusted to us. Would you forgive us for that sense of entitlement or ownership that prevents us from benefiting from your blessing? God, help us in that. We all need it. There is refining that we always need to do. But we pray, God, most of all, that you would continue to teach us how to best use our resources. These buildings, this property, our energy, our time, for the sake of your kingdom, for the benefit of others that men and women and boys and girls would know the, and understand the significance of the love of Jesus for them and that they, they too would place their faith in Christ. God, would you pour out your grace, not just to us, but through us. And would you do what is necessary to make us move in that direction? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing the closing song with us. Cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree.
much for spending some time uh, together with us. Talking on topics like this can be a little challenging for some people, and if you would like to discuss that personally, uh, I would welcome the chance to do so with you. Uh, I don't profess to be an expert. I can only share with you how God's been gracious to us as we continue to learn these things that we have spoken about both personally and as a church family over the years. For now, may this, uh, may this prayer, this benediction prayer be yours. It's what Paul wrote to the Philippians, who were some of those who gave out of extreme poverty. He says, I have received full payment and have more than enough. May this also be true for us. May you be amply supplied, knowing that the gifts that God gives are being sent to you. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his riches, the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. In all God's people said, Amen. 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 God be with you. Enjoy your day. And have a great week. Go Chiefs. <laughs> Did I say that? Did I say that out loud? Gross. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>